uh, which did not get the space tree because not uh, all of them were, I mean, not that quantity of pastries was prepared for such a um, uh, number of pupils. And when the Nazis understood that some of children are alive, they asked their so-called doctors, of course, they were not medicians or they were also Nazis. They just put this poison in the mouth of uh, these several children and within 15 minutes they were also dead. They took the bodies, this particular days of 245 Kirchen children, which they poisoned with their own hands, and they brought them to the, I don't know, stock or a big hole or, I don't know, uh, you name it, yeah. something in the ground. Mass grave. Probably. It's, you know, uh, mass grave contains of two words, mass and grave. It's a grave. Mm -hmm. It was not a grave. It was just uh, a localization uh, in seven kilometers from the city of Kerch. And when the Nazis went back to the city, of course, without the children, because the children were dead and already in the stock, they told their parents that they brought their children on holidays for the rest. And this is the bridge which reached Crimea in this particular city. Can you imagine how people in Crimea, in this particular place, feels when they hear and listen this audio of four represent high officials of Luftwaffe, I mean, the air, uh, military aircrafts of Germany, who are discussing frequently with uh, it, it, being in very nice mood how they will destroy the Kirchen because Kirchen people call this Crimean bridge Kirchen Bridge. bridge. Yeah. Do you understand how these people from Crimea, Crimean people, feel about listening to this audio piece, understanding that those are grandchildren of that Nazis which killed their mm -hmm. relatives 80 years ago, and now they're preparing to kill more Russians in Crimea. Do you understand what is going on? This is a revenge. This is something which was not committed 80 years ago completely. They did not kill us those times, and they're back. It's, what it's about said. it's about uh, uh, Schwar Schwarzenegger being Terminator in the first part of this movie when he told that he would be back, and he is back, but not as a good guy, but still is a bad one. They're back to kill us. Do you understand this? I don't think I can understand it. As and they do not have limits. They do not have any limits if they are eager and willing to support all sorts of terrorist attack committed by Zelensky addressed to the civilian people, civilians. Mm -hmm. They do not have any red lines, any limits, nothing. So... Do it, you understand? I'm sorry. That, no, that I, was, no, 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 that was Russia. That was post-Soviet Union. I mean, that was Soviet Union, and after that was Russia. That was Soviet Union under Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. And that was Russia as a part of Soviet uh, Union, which fully, not only agreed, but fully, 100%, with open heart, supported unification of Germany in 90s. 80s and 90s, do you understand? And do you, do you know that this was United States of America? I mean, under American president those times, which were absolutely against of two parts of Germany, the Western part and the Eastern parts reunited. America was against and we were for this. We as Russians, as Russia, as Soviet Union suffered so much from them. We lost more than 20 millions of people of different nationalities, not dividing out of ourselves into different groups of Russians, Belarusians, Jews, I don't know, Gypsies or Tatars or uh, Chechen, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, no. We just count ourselves as people mm -hmm. of one country. We lost more than 20 millions those times and now they're back. Even if we were for Germans reunification, mm -hmm. And even we were building pipe, I mean, I mean this gas pipelines yes, yes. to bring our resources, our natural resources to the Germans, which were killing us 80 years ago. We invested our money, our resources, our power, our might, and I don't know, our goodwill into this energy projects with the country which occupied Russia just, in, just stopped closer to Ural, just in the, in this, in the middle of a country. Mm -hmm. It was occupied, and 20 millions of people were killed, and killed not softly. Zhukov said, we liberated Europe from Nazism, yeah. and that they'll never forgive us. It's exactly what's happening today. Absolutely. W one thing I notice about you and about any Russian officials I've spoken to, including uh, Mr. Minister Lavrov, is that you all have a very sincere, you know, emotional, not in a negative way, like a, a, you're guided by sincere emotions about what has happened in the past. You don't forget history and also using that to guide the future and trying to protect future generations of Russians and, and people all across the world. In America, not so much. You know, your counterparts in America seem to be 
happy taking their America vacation is different. time. No, I don't agree with you. America is different, first of all. There are lots of people in America uh, which, uh, or who, better to say, uh, know their history, struggle for their history. Uh, secondly, we already mentioned this, uh, America is brainwashed. America, even in spite of the variety of possibilities of reaching information, mm -hmm. has a lack of information. Which is, it's, it's really a contradictional thing. Why? You have an open sources and internet. You have so many channels. For example, in the United States of America, you can switch channels until morning. <laughs> Just, uh, it, it never stops. I mean, I don't know even how many channels. It's all the same, though. But still, you, you have a variety of uh, media outlets. But this is a fantastic contradiction. You are even less informed when uh, our previous generation were, probably f uh, 50 years ago. This is something uh, extraordinary, but this is happening. So the second thing, America is brainwashed. Um, thirdly, America is much more focused or on each day life, how to survive, how to survive. Um, pragmatic. Pragmatic. I mean, uh, pri I mean, prices are going up. Mm -hmm. um, lots of problems, uh, post-COVID things. Uh, mm, I mean, all this uh, health and medicine and all this, uh, all this sphere is very also dramatically uh, developing. And so lots of just local each day problems uh, which have to be resolved somehow. And so I think those are three reasons why people are not very much focused. But uh, when we're going back to the uh, number one thing, uh, still there are people which are struggling for the history. Yeah, but I, I just don't see any Americans as sincerely concerned about the history, the true history. Most Americans think that they won World War II. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a rewriting of history. And also, um, it seems like many Americans, whether it is coming from a pragmatic sense or not, they seem more consumed with getting their next campaign contribution from Raytheon than stopping a war, stopping a genocide. You know that I used to live in the United States for three years, more than a little bit more than three years. I used to work there. I was mm -hmm. uh, a spokeswoman uh, for the Russian mission to the uh, United Nations and as a press secretary for the uh, Russian mission to UN. And uh, of course, you are spending, we do not have our embassy in uh, New York. We have an, an embassy in Washington. So in New York, we have a Russian general consulate and Russian mission. And you are spending all the time uh, just with Americans or people of other nationalities uh, which present their countries in the United Nations. But you are not living in the closed area of the embassy. You are living just, just in the streets, in the shops, in the cafeterias, in restaurants, I don't know, in gyms. And you're just surrounded by American people and you, you, you feel them, you, you understand them. You're in, I can tell you, I have, I have a possibility to compare Americans with other people in the world. Because I used to live in, for example, China for many years with my parents, my father he used to work as a diplomat in Russian embassy in Soviet and Russian embassy in Beijing and in Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I traveled all over the world, but not as a, on my own, but as a member of official delegations. And I have lots of foreign friends and I dealing last many years with uh, foreign correspondents. And I have a possibility to compare. And Americans are, I, I really, um, I hate to say this, but I need to say this. Americans are more, are most uh, frightened people in the world. It's impossible. It couldn't be true. But they are so much or so much afraid of, I don't know, government, system, uh, taxes, uh, economy, the future of their children, that they are the most frightened people. But not because of their nature. No, they are willing to be free and they are searching for this freedom uh, as the citizens and in, in person, but they're so much frightened. They, they recalled me so many times, Soviet period, when people were sitting in the kitchen whispering to each other, not having possibility to use loud voice or just normal voice to discuss some politics things, or they just uh, preferred not to discuss politics at all, uh, not uh, having jokes about policy or pol uh, uh, leaders of the Soviet Union. No, that was forbidden, and they were just whispering. And I think that this is something that happened to the United States when people are not discussing people of things which are very important for them loudly, publicly. They prefer not to deal with, for example, some foreigners, not to be, you know, under, yeah. <laughs> uh, under focused by Mr. Smiths, and uh, I don't know how you call them, secret services. And That's true. They, they, they are free of uh, being in, uh, not in relationship, but in sort of communication by emails or something with people from Russia, is <laughs> something terrible for them. You never, you will never meet uh, a nation which is so much, much frightened uh, as Americans in our days. I, I, I cannot compare with Americans, for example, of 50s or 60s or 70s. I have no this experience. I just met with that America uh, of that period uh, when I'm reading or watching movies. I do like American movies of 60s and 70s uh, and Nowells, but I've never been communicating with uh, that period in my real life. But what I've met in 2005, 2006, and mm -hmm. seven, and especially today, 
it is uh, it's something terrible. And another thing, it's uh, the criminal situation, which just added this uh, this I don't know the emotion of I don't know, shocking mm -hmm. uh, how to say strach F uh, fear yes of shocking fear uh, this is something. Some, some of the fears are delusional and have no basis in reality, but some are very real. Like you mentioned, the Secret Service one day, they just killed Gonzalo Lira, a close friend of mine. May he rest in peace in Ukraine. And that was done with U.S. taxpayer dollars funded to Ukraine, and then they killed him. That was, uh, I guess, two, no, that was uh, 2021, just after this uh, uh, pandemic year, and, uh, but before uh, Russian special operations started. So I was uh, still communicating with the majority of my American friends. Mm -hmm. I've arrived uh, to New York and I was meeting one of my greatest uh, friends. She's originally uh, Russian Jewish, but she immigrated to the United States uh, like 50 years ago. So, so she's much more local. And uh, we were somewhere in between thing. Um, First Avenue and 58th Street. So, like you know, this is the center of the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were sitting in a very nice restaurant, an old one, I mean, the fashionable one. And what, and what I was facing there, it was really shocking for me because uh, the friend of mine, uh, she was just after, after the meal, after, that was an evening, that was about like 9 or uh, even 10 p.m. And after the meal, when we were already um, uh, finishing our uh, dinner, she tried to turn her rings, uh, I mean, stone upside down. upside down. She tried to put uh, her her earrings into the pocket, and I was asking, "What are you doing?" She was, "It is dangerous." I told her, "Come on, this is like fifth. I mean, fifty uh, seventh Street. This is the center. This is Mecca and the Medina of your social life. It's Manhattan, dear." And uh, she told me, "No, no, no. Everything changed. It's uh, dangerous because they know me." I told who she told me. I mean, people who are working here, they know me, they know where I'm living, and they know my diamond rings and my diamond earrings, and it's it's not safety enough. So come on, what is going on? So I think it's a combination of real, I do uh, agree with your real fears, um, because the uh, situation with crime in the United States yeah. is terrible. It's uncomparable with uh, other parts of the world. I mean, with so-called civilized countries. Um, uh, and this, uh, the combina it's a combination of surreal fears, which came from this deep state propaganda and uh, an atmosphere of, you know, conspiracy and Russia is involving in, yeah, mockertism, mockertism. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I do want to ask you a, a question related to some recent events. Uh, President Putin, in an interview today with Sputnik, and he said that, you know, these Western countries, they treat us like they have no red lines for us. They, they just do anything and everything. Of course, we just discussed the Kursk Bridge. Uh, that was uh, the statements made by, I guess that was the president or, I mean, the leader or from Latvia or Litva, one of the Baltic states, that mm -hmm. they will drop all the red lines. Yeah. Uh, so, that was, I mean, that was the response of uh, President Putin uh, to the question related to the statements of NATO countries saying that they will not have any sort of red lines towards Russia. And I'm asked, I, I, I asked, uh, in my Telegram account, that was two days ago, I asked the audience, what red lines did Latvia have? <laughs> except, her, ex, uh, except her borders. <laughs> the only red line that Latvia has is her border. Yeah. Uh, is Latvia is going to just, uh, I don't know, withdraw or uh, blow up uh, her border as a red line or what? What they're talking about? Mm -hmm. I have an answer. They are using these strong words. They are using this aggressive approach. They are uh, using this um, irresponsible behavior just as a provocation. They are provocating us, but not on their own. Unfortunately, they are in the front line. They are like puppies. Uh, not puppies, but puppets. They are puppets. It's like Muppet Show. And uh, the arms are inside of them. Yeah. And their arms are across the ocean. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, it's, it seems as though the countries who can have already violated uh, just about as many red lines as you can until you start getting into very dangerous territories. And I was going to ask you, what do you think it says about the leadership of the Russian Federation in this moment, that they have been so stable and calm and stoic in the face of all these provocations, as you so aptly described? We are struggling not with Ukraine, as you understand. We, uh, we, I mean, Russia was one of the first countries, probably one of the first, which in, not only in written, not only uh, in the uh, area or in the ba on the base of international law, but in reality, in real life, recognized Ukraine as an independent state. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was the early 90s. Uh, we established, uh, just immediately, immediately, we established our embassy, not, a, for example, a mission, or not a sort of a political organ, uh, but that was a diplomatic mission, how we used to have with the United States of America, uh, Great Britain, I don't know, China, Vietnam, um, Zambia, and other countries. Normal, 
according to the uh, Vienna, uh, Vienna um, Convention, mm -hmm. diplomatic mission in Ukraine. We respected fully, absolutely, um, with no doubt, Ukraine as a sovereign, independent state. We signed international agreements with Ukraine. Still, we had uh, not, not only so much in common, but we have just factories, I don't know, we have uh, industry, uh, we have uh, logistics and transport still uh, lasting from Soviet Union. I mean, yes. joint, jointly working uh, between not two countries, but two, two spheres. But still, we recognize Ukraine as an independent state and still, we absolutely, 100% uh, respected and treated respectfully Ukraine as an independent state. And that lasted for decades. So what went wrong with us? Why did they do all this? Not because of us, but because United States of America, Great Britain, Collective Brussels, uh, Berlin, and Paris, and Warsaw, with the assistance, not the help, but the assistance of Baltic states, several times, not once, but several times, committed anti-constitutional anti coups uh, regime change in Ukraine. Why they did it? Why did they have this right to do so? Nobody had an answer. What was the purpose? Provocation. To provoke whom? Russia. To, to do what? To just, I don't know, collapse the region, to bring two nations, two peoples, or one people, because it's historically so dramatic to divide who is Russian, who is Ukrainian. It's even impossible because my grandfather. He has a Ukrainian last name. My mother, she has a Ukrainian last name. But they never um, treated themselves or me as partly Ukrainian or partly Russian. We were Russian because we used Russian language. We lived in Russia, but we had Ukrainian's last name in our family. My uncle still had a Ukrainian last name. And each Sunday and Saturday, we uh, joined together for a meal. And just, it's, it's okay with us. And it was okay with uh, millions of people. So the main goal of that provocation, which lasted for many years, was to just, I don't know how to say, to split or to collapse or All to determine or uh, you name it, yeah. uh, two peoples or one people from inside. It's, it's, it's a real evil. This is an evil. This is hell. And uh, there is no forgiveness in this, uh, on this planet mm -hmm. uh, for those who committed this crime. There is no forgiveness. Not because we don't want to forgive, uh, because there is no... Uh, there is no possible, there is no such a strength, there is no such a might uh, for human being to forgive this because it is, it's an evil as it is. It's the devil inside of this provocation. And what they did, for example, with Orthodox Church in Ukraine, yeah. <laughs> come on, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. You will never meet something even closer to this. They just cut uh, the Orthodox Church and Orthodox as just people, as uh, Christians, Orthodox Christians. They just cut one part from another part just because they told one part that another part is bad, and this is it. As simple as this. Not because of rituals, not because of traditions, not because of the language which used within this uh, Orthodox Church. No, just because they split it and they just told to each other that, guys, you, you, won't, be, you won't be together anymore, and this is it. Apparently those are the Western values that we're protecting in the United States. Let's remember, let's recall that there is such a word in our life, and let's us not uh, forget it, because when people are forgetting their history, their own history, they're forgetting about their own mistakes. That bring them to repeat their mistakes more and more. Mm -hmm. When people are forgetting about peace, the war reminds them about peace. And we shouldn't follow this route. It's very dangerous, and we've been there already. And I don't want, I don't want to be uh, there anymore. I don't want to uh, repeat uh, or to follow the yellow brick road again, uh, because that was not a good road, because that was a road of several years war, 80 years ago. And I really suffering, because millions of people now on planet do not realize they're still eating, dancing, relaxing, uh, voting, I don't know, uh, growing just, children, which is good, which is good. And, and, and my people in my country are doing so. But in my country, my people are asking questions, and they are watching what is going on in the world, and they are watching it from the closer distance than it's going on in the United States of America. I agree. They I, are, I've been... I will tell you what you should ask your people. You should ask, this year, 2024, you, are, uh, you will vote and you will choose candidates. But you shouldn't. You should choose not the candidates in, and even not the programs. You should choose between war and peace. And this is dramatically important. Well, on that note, I think that's a good message to leave off for the audience. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, I learned a lot. And I hope our audience did as well. I so. probably someday I will join you uh, when I will come when I will come to United States of America.
I have met certain Uyghurs. It's always possible to find individuals who criticize the central authorities. I have met Uyghurs on my trip to China, and I assure you, at the very least, from what I heard with my own ears, that on the whole, they welcome the policies of the Chinese authorities in this area. They believe that China has done a great deal for people who live in this part of the country from the perspective of the economy, raising the cultural level, and so on and so forth. So why should I offer assessments looking at the situation you, you know, from outside? You know Indeed. But you know, you know there are many uh, Uyghurs who do not say that, and that America has accused China of genocide. The Secretary of State has accused China of genocide over the Uyghurs. Uh, there is the accusation of a million uh, Uyghurs in so-called concentration camps. Is, is that your message to the Muslim communities in the former Soviet Union? You don't think anything wrong is happening there? As far as the Muslim community in Russia, I need to give a message to it through the policies of the Russian authorities vis-à-vis -vis Muslims in the Russian Federation. That is how I need to give a message to the Muslim community in the Russian Federation. Russia is an observer in the Organization of Islamic Conference. About 10% of our population, perhaps a little more, are Muslims. They are citizens of the Russian Federation who do not have another fatherland. They are making a colossal contribution to the development of this country, and that pertains to both clerics and ordinary citizens. Why should I speak to and build a relationship with this segment of our population by reference to the situation in China without understanding thoroughly what is happening there? I think you're better off asking about all these problems, the foreign minister of the Chinese People's Republic or the State Department. It's just a question of whether you are prepared to criticize China. China, for example, abstained on Crimea at the Security Council. Uh, China's biggest banks have not...